Okay, we're now recording. I think this this is our Zoom session number two for 120 Anatomy. I think last week we covered the overview of the entire ding dong ear. I think we went over an overview of the outer, the middle, the inner ear, the eighth nerve, and then the brain stem all the way up to the auditory cortex. Just kind of an overview. Well, today we're going to now burrow down into a more detailed discussion of the outer ear. Now, essentially, a lot of people think the outer ear is the largest and the most useless part of the ear. Well, yeah, not bad to hook glasses on, I guess, hang earrings in, but it has other purposes aside from that, too, and we will look at those. First of all, when we take a peek at the outer ear, I'll share a screen here and we'll, sh we'll show some uh, pictures here. So yeah, today we're going to be doing Unit 1, Outer Overview, no, not, that was yesterday, last week. Unit 2, Outer Ear Anatomy Physiology, then Unit 3 next week, Middle Ear, and Middle Ear again, Middle Ear Anatomy and Physiology. We will spend at least two weeks on the Middle Ear. Then when you get to the Inner Ear, we spend two weeks on Inner Ear Anatomy, two more weeks on Inner Ear Physiology, and then a week on the Central Auditory Nervous System and all that stuff. So... But let's go and take a look-see at our PowerPoint slide here showing the outer ear. So when you're looking at the outer ear itself, make its pieces and parts your friends, because as, as an HIS, this is the part you will see the most, of course. This is the part you're going to be handling, lifting, pulling back, looking in to see if there's earwax, all of that jazz. Now, this is a cross-section of the outer ear, this picture that I'm showing you, and a couple of things should meet your eye. One, the outer ear canal is about an inch long. In metric, it's about two and a half centimeters. So let's make sure we get a good grip on what a centimeter is, and a centimeter is about the width of your fingernail. So when you look at your fingernails on one of your larger fingers, the width of your fingernail is about a centimeter. Two and a half of those makes about an inch. Okay, so you're looking at your outer ear canal from here, where my cursor is, to your eardrum is about an inch long. Notice that the skin covers both bone and cartilage. Now, when you're thinking about the outer ear that way, that the skin covers bone and cartilage, I'll stop sharing, and let's look at our noses. When you grab your nose, you can bend the end of it, okay? That's because the skin covers cartilage. But the skin up here covers bone. Now, when you have that skin, there's nothing underneath it but bone. Just like the skin on your shin, if you feel the front of your leg, okay, the back calf has muscle and everything, but the front of the leg, the skin just covers bone. And if you've ever banged your shin against the hitch of a car or something like that, you'll know what I mean when we say there's not much give when it comes to that area. So in the interests of, you know, that looked like a little, uh, a little pooch you had behind you there. Neat. <laughs> Anyway, um, so look at the skin covering the bone. That bone, okay, that skin is very tender. That's why when people put Q-tips in an ear and you touch that part, there's no give at all. That's the part where the skin can bleed very easily. But something else, the skin that covers the cartilage, that's where wax is produced. So your, the glands that form earwax are glands underneath the cartilaginous portion of your ear canal. When you're looking in men's ears especially, more than women's, there's hair in the ears as well. And a lot of the hair in men's ears is on the cartilaginous portion of the ear canal, namely the outer portion. And that's why when you put a Q-tip in your ear to get the earwax out, you're actually pushing wax in, and wax is not, repeat, not produced by the skin here in the bony portion. That skin is as smooth as a baby's behind. There's no glands underneath it. There's nothing but bone. Now, the outer ear itself, you can wiggle all over the place. And when you're looking into an ear, 
You should always pull the ear up and back, up and back. The reason why is because your ear canal is actually shaped like a dog leg. There's two bends in your ear canal. Okay, think of like a, on a golf course, you got to get around a dog leg. Okay, there's a corner and another corner and then straight. So your ear canal is not like just one round cylinder. It's kind of like a, and it's got a bend to it. If we take a look at our next slide here, the pieces and parts of the outer ear. It's called the pinna, P-I-N-N-A, or it's called the oracle, A-U-R. I C L E, pinna or oracle. And that's the outer ear itself. That's not the canal. Okay, the outer ear canal is shown here. And the, uh, the, the pieces and parts of the outer ear itself, the pinna, are shown here. Now, this round part where I'm drawing here with my cursor, that's called your helix. So the outer rim of the ear is the helix. And then you'll see this part right here where I'm circling. That's called the anti-helix. So you have your helix, and I'll stop sharing, and it can even show you on my ugly old ear. The helix, and then the anti-helix is the next ridge, the next bump in. And then the bowl of the ear is called the concha, C-O-N-C-H-A, concha. So you can see it here, concha. Now they call it concha cava. Who cares? Just concha, okay? That's the bowl. Then you're going to see this part here. That's called the tragus. Now, the tragus, if I look at it on the previous slide, it's not shown. You can't see it. So if I look at the, if I show you on my ear, the tragus is this little bump. Now, when you're going to plug your ears, because you don't want to hear something, don't put your fingers in your ears. It's best to push against the tragus. Just eh and block it that way, okay? Just like if you want to stop seeing from one eye, don't have your hand flat and push against your eyeball. You cup your hand, not to touch the eye, but you block it. Same with when you're plugging an ear, you push on the tragus hard against in your, in your ear canal. Now they call it tragus, T-R-A-G-U-S, because that's Greek for goat's beard. <laughs> goat's beard, well, if you're looking in, old men's ears, it's in here where the hair grows, okay? <laughs> You're going to see a lot of hairy ears, especially in older men. <laughs> sometimes when you are taking ear mold impressions so you can make the shape of a hearing aid, sometimes you even have to snip the hair with scissors, but uh, we'll get there. <laughs> and, of course, here's your earlobe. Now, we never mess with the earlobes in our field. We don't need them, okay? So... The pieces and parts to remember, the helix, and then where I'm tracing it with my cursor, the anti-helix, the concha, the tragus. Okay? Good. If you're looking in the outer ear canal, let's go underneath the skin right here. So where I'm drawing with my cursor, let's look under that skin, okay? Under the cartilaginous portion of your outer ear. Look at all the glands there. And read at the top, ceruminous glands, ceruminous. Well, earwax is called cerumen. And you can see I'll circle the word right here at the bottom, cerumen, okay? That's the regular medical term for earwax. Now, when you think of the word and you're writing someone a card or a letter and you say, sincerely, comma, Audra, or sincerely, comma, Ted. The word sincere means without wax. Okay, sine is Latin for without. Sere is wax in Latin. Without wax, Ted Venema. <laughs> now, what does that have to do with writing a letter? Well, in the Roman times, if you really loved someone, you gave the person a silver statue that was not filled with wax. It was solid silver. If you were cheap, you'd give the person a, sa a statue and it was filled with wax to give its weight. So sincerely means without wax. Anyway, the words cerumen and sincere, there's a common Latin root meaning. I know you came here online to hear just that. I knew that that was very important to you. That's why I thought I'd share it.
Okay, here we go. Now we will look at our what we have in our notes so far. Let's read it. Oracle or pinna. The largest part of the ear, very individual. Did you know that in England, they also take ear impressions of criminals as well as fingerprints? Because your outer ear shape is only yours. And there's no two outer ears alike. Your outer ear comes from nine different pieces during embryological development. So you have nine to the ninth power. Nine times nine times nine times nine times, you know, nine, that many times possible arrangements for the shape of your outer ear. It's absolutely disgusting. Anyway, the largest part of the ear, very individual, the parts, helix, antihelix, tragus, don't worry about antitragus, concha, Greek for shell. The ear canal is often called the external auditory meatus. And in Latin, the meatus, the word meatus doesn't mean meat with an us on the end. It means opening or channel. Okay? It's a tunnel. In adults, it's about an inch long, two and a half centimeters. Don't worry about the millimeters high and six millimeters hot wide. Don't worry about that at all. By the way, what the heck is a millimeter? Well, a millimeter is a tenth of a centimeter. Ten centimeters is a decimeter. <laughs> Ten decimeters is a meter. A thousand meters is a kilometer. All right, so going down the other way, a centimeter, break that down into ten pieces, you've got a millimeter. Okay, just to give you an idea. Hearing aids, we often talk about things in terms of millimeters. Things get kind of small that way. So anyway. Don't worry about the, the, the millimeters high and millimeters wide, because everybody's is different. It has two bends. So if you look what I'm highlighting here, two bends. Important to know for taking ear impressions for hearing aids. There's, there's a, a curve to it. It's about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, last time I looked, that's blood temperature, okay? Bugs would love to crawl into your outer ears. Bugs, however, don't like cerumen. That's one reason you have cerumen. It's a bug retardant. Now in Canada, we call 98.6, 37 Celsius. Okay, that's our temperatures here. Boiling is 100 here, freezing is zero here. Zero to 100 makes more sense to me than 212 and 32, but oh well. That's the way it is. So anyway, your outer ear canal is surrounded by the mastoid portion of your temporal bone. So mastoid, this, see how the bone has all these holes in it? That means it's what they call pneumatic, P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-C. There's lots of holes in it, pneumatic. Okay, they call it pneumonia when you get infection of the lungs because all the little sacs in your lungs get infected. Pneumatic just means lots of little air holes. And so that's called your mastoid bone. If you put your finger behind your ear, so feel the bone behind your ear. See that round bone there? That's your mastoid bone too. When people do hearing tests, one of the hearing tests that's done, after they take headphones off and lay them down on the table, they'll put a headband on you, and it'll have a little black box about an inch long. And that little black box, they'll set it straight on the mastoid bone. They'll deliver pure tones that way, too. So they call sound from headphones, they call that air conduction, because the sound is going through the air into your ear. And they call this bone conduction. And when they test by bone conduction, you're avoiding the outer ear and you're avoiding the middle ear. You're bypassing the outer and the middle ear. And HIS is compare your hearing levels by air conduction versus bone conduction to tell whether your problem is in the middle ear, the outer ear, or the inner ear. You're going to learn that in 130 audiometry, air conduction and bone, but you can say you heard it first here. All right, here we go. All right, outer half of the ear canal is, is surrounded 
But no, the outer ear canal is surrounded by mastoid portion of the temporal bone. What the heck is a temporal bone? The whole side bone of your skull. There's two pieces to the temporal bone. The mastoid portion, which surrounds your outer ear and middle ears. And then there's a portion called the petrus portion. Petrus after the apostle Peter. The rock, it's the hardest bone of the body. And the petrous bone surrounds your ear. So the petrous portion of your temporal bone surrounds your inner ear. The mastoid portion of your temporal bone surrounds your outer and middle ears. The mastoid portion is pneumatic, has lots of holes in it. And the petrous portion doesn't. It's solid, just solid as a rock. We'll get to that much later in the course again. But I always like explaining things once at the very beginning so that when you reach it in the second half of the course, you'll go, oh, yeah, I heard that before. That's right. When you watch a movie twice, you get to learn a whole lot more than if you just watch it once. So that's my theory is always two steps forward, one step back. Two forward, one back. Anyway, here we go. Outer half. So here we go. Middle ear space part of the middle ear space and concha, cochlea, are surrounded by the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So you should write in the front right here, part of middle ear space and all of the cochlea is surrounded by petrous portion of the temporal bone. Outer ear canal and part of the middle ear space are surrounded by the mastoid portion of the temporal bone. Back to the outer half of the ear canal. The skin covers cartilage. Inner half of the ear canal, the skin covers bone. Hair in old man's ears, sebaceous glands create cerumen. Okay, sebaceous glands underneath the skin are producing cerumen. And wax is cerumen, and that's where your ear wax is formed. Nothing wrong with earwax. It's no different than mucus in the nose. It's all part of life. Okay. This is called an otoscope. You will be using these later on through your studies at Ozarks. You're going to be looking into people's ears with an otoscope. This is the handle that holds the batteries. And the light is in here. And this part here is called your speculum. This part here, you change from person to person. You take the old one off, you put it in the cleaner, you take a new one from the drawer and you put it on. You just simply twist it on. And it focuses the light into the ear canal. You'll be bracing against the cheek and holding the light and pulling the ear up and back so as to look in and you're going to want to see a nice eardrum. And we'll take a look-see at some eardrums. Why not? Why don't we just take a peek at what you're going to see? When you look in an eardrum, okay, this is the right ear. You're going to see a round drum. You're going to see a teardrop down the center. And that's actually part of the malleus, part of the first bone of your middle ear space. It's attached to the back side of your eardrum. When you look at an eardrum, it's kind of looking at a bathroom window. You know how when you look at a bathroom window, you can see shadows, but you can't really see through it. It's translucent. It's kind of grayed out. Okay, well, that's the same as your eardrum. You can kind of see through it, but not clearly like a regular glass window. Then you're going to see this cone of light. And that is actually just a reflection off of your otoscope. In a healthy eardrum, you should see a cone of light. When you're looking in the right ear, it should be at 5 o'clock. When you're looking in the left ear, it should be at 7 o'clock. And you'll notice this. You'll see this when you start looking in people's ears with an otoscope. All right, when you're looking at the eardrum, the big part here, the round part is called the pars, P-A-R-S, tensa, T-A-N-S-A, pars tensa. That's the main part of your eardrum, pars tensa. 
And when you look at the top of the drum, you'll see this wee little area here, and that's called your pars flaccida, flaccid, it's the soft part. So your pars tensa is the main part of your eardrum. You have the pars flaccida though, so that, you know how when you're going upstairs, or up, a, I should say up a mountain, you're climbing, or you're, you're, you're going up an elevator of a real tall building and your ears pop because the air pressure's changing. Or if you've ever flown on a plane and your ears change, you know, the air pressure. Well, your pars flaccida is meant to accommodate tiny changes in air pressure, even if you go up a hill or up a flight of stairs, okay? It accommodates tiny changes in air pressure without you having to swallow and open up your eustachian tubes to your throat. Because you know when, when you really blow your nose hard, you can feel it in your ears, or when you're trying to equalize the air pressure, you, you know, you can do that and blow air up the tubes from your throat to your ears. It can be dangerous, so you have to be careful. But your air pressure behind your eardrum it's happy, your whole ear is happier when the air pressure outside the eardrum is the same as the air pressure behind your eardrum. So the air pressure in your ear canal, if it's even Steven with the air pressure in your middle ear, your whole ear is happy. But when they are uneven, when children get earaches, they get negative air pressure in their middle ear and now their eardrums are like this they're sucked inward and that's called an earache that's what hurts okay and then the middle ears begin to fill up with pus and now they're like this and that also is an earache that hurts and that's the air pressure is uneven between the middle ear and the outer ear well, the pars flaccida accommodates tiny changes in air pressure that may occur from going up a flight of stairs or going up 10 or 15 feet. That's essentially the purpose of it. If you look more like now at the eardrum itself, you'll see this, the center is called the umbo, U-M-B-O, umbo. Okay, that's the dead center of your eardrum. Your eardrum is actually a concave thing, much like a speaker cone. It's indented inward. Okay, so my, my eardrum here would be like this, and my eardrum here would be like that. It's, it's indented. It's concave. All right? So the umbo is the furthest in portion, and the eardrum is kind of goes out more like a speaker. So this divides the pars flaccida from the pars tensa. They call that shrapnel's membrane. Don't worry about it, I don't care. This is called the manubrium, manubrium, M-A-N-U, manubrium, B-R-I-U-M, manubrium, handle, it's called the hand, manu, the handle, okay, manubrium of the malleus. And the malleus, M-A-L-L-E-U-S, is the hammer. You have the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Well, the malleus, incus, stapes. The handle of the malleus bone is this teardrop shape. And the dead end of it is called the umbo. The eardrum is often called the tympanic membrane. Let's go to a different slide. Whoa, okay. All right, orientation of a tympanic membrane in an adult, orientation of a tympanic membrane in a child or infant. Note the horizontal plane of an infant tympanic membrane, which makes visualization of the eardrum difficult. Well, not to worry, because the HIS is not testing infants or babies. So, not a concern for us. Here's a picture of the outer ear canal in yellow. And here's kind of the outer rim of an eardrum. And here's the skin of the pars tensa. Here is the manubrium of the malleus. And you can see that the eardrum has several, or several, three layers. It's got the outer layer, the inner layer, this red area. Think of this red area as the area of your middle ear space. They've just taken the bones out. So this is your middle ear space. 
This whole blue here area is your eardrum. And you'll see that the eardrum has three layers. The inner layer, the middle layer, the outer layer. So the middle layer is the tough, fibrous layer. You could call that the arachnid layer, the, like the spider. Okay, it's like the spokes of a wheel. It's the tough layer. It's what makes the eardrum tough and tense. That middle ear is the very fibrous area or, or layer of the eardrum. Your outer layer is continuous with the skin of your outer ear canal, and the inner layer is continuous with the skin of your middle ear space. <clears throat> There's lots to tell you here. I'll just be talking, and then we'll look at the notes, and you'll see everything I've been talking about in the notes. But allow me to just finish here saying, during embryological development, we begin with three layers of tissue. The embryonic disc after conception. Sperm meets egg. Conception begins. You've got the division of cells. And you're going to have three layers of tissue. Ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Ectoderm, E-C-T-O, derm as in skin. Ectoderm forms skin and nerves. Ectoderm. Mesoderm, M-E-S-O, mesoderm forms bones and muscle. Bones and muscle. And endoderm, E-N-D-O, endo means inside. Endoderm forms anything that's slimy. <laughs> so your guts, all your organs, the inside of your cheeks, anything that's wet in your body, okay, endoderm. So when you look at the eardrum, it's the only one piece of your body that retains all three of those original embryonic tissues, endoderm, mesoderm, ectoderm. Just a piece of, well, interest, I suppose. All right. Now, the neat thing, let's read in our notes here, but before we go there, look at this graph. This kind of relates to acoustics that we studied this morning in 110. What you're looking at here is frequency. 125, low C on a piano, 250, middle C, 500, high C, and look at the octaves going higher. These are the seven octave frequencies that we do hearing tests. Now, here's your decibels, here's your frequency, and here's a line saying zero, 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 zero. It's, this means that your outer ear is not resonating to these sounds. It's doing nothing, doing nothing, doing nothing, doing nothing. All of a sudden, when I get to 1500 hertz, my outer ear is beginning to resonate. 2,000, 2,700 especially, 4,000 hertz, still resonating, offering about 20 decibels, and you'll learn what that is later on, but 20 decibels, and where is the lift, where is the resonance taking place? In the high frequencies, and what parts of speech are in the high frequencies? The consonants. So your outer ear, the helix, Antihelix, concha bowl, external auditory meatus, all of that is shaped the way it is so that it resonates naturally to give a lift to the high frequencies of speech. They call it speech and hearing. And when you look at this graph, this is a complicated this, okay? This is Ted Venema drawing. This is research. Okay. But look what they're doing. The ear canal, number five. Okay, e external ear canal and eardrum. Number three, the concha. And all these other factors, add them all up and you've got T for total. And that total is drawn right over top of 2700 hertz. And that's why I just simplified it and drew it like this. So this is the complicated way. This is the, re I should say, this is the TED way. This is the complicated way, but they're all telling the same story. 
Now, if we move on, here's your outer ear canal, here's your ear, here's the letters of speech, and these letters of speech are drawn on what's called an audiogram. So when you look at this, this is what you're going to be doing a hearing test. This is what your hearing tests look like. 125 is not on here, but ignore that. 250, 500, 1,000, 2,000 hertz, 4,000 hertz, 8,000 hertz. And the decibels increasing, going down. And the, la the sounds of speech. So you put your hand to your throat and say the letter Z. Z. You feel your voice. Z. Say the letter M. M. Feel that vibrate? M. Say the letter A, U, E. But now when you're saying K, S, T, it's no longer vibrating. Those sounds are higher pitched and they're softer. So when you're going over to here and we share a screen, these sounds K, S, T, are softer in decibels and they're higher in pitch. That's why you've got your outer ear canal resonance to help us hear those sounds better because naturally those sounds are softer. So when I say the word Paul, let the name Paul, what's the loudest part? Ah, the p isn't very loud at all. If I say this, the word church, the loudest parts of church are er, speech, Ted, the T and D aren't very loud. It's the eh that's the loudest, and that's the vowels. Anyway, that's why your outer ear doesn't need to add anything there. All to make a long story short, I just think it's nice to tie things together. Here's bone conduction. This is what I was telling you earlier about. They put a bone, a, a little thing, one inch long, on the mastoid bone, and you're delivering the sound now through the bone, and you're bypassing the outer ear canal, See how the skin covers cartilage and bone? Bypassing the middle ear, the malleus, incus, and stapes, and delivering the sound straight into the inner ear or cochlea. Doo -dee -doo -doo. We'll show you some pictures of some pathologies of the ear. But before we do that, let's look at our, at our notes. Where did we come from? Now let's just put some of the stuff down in writing. Okay, I'll take a sip of my coffee here. Ah, all right. Inner half of the ear canal where I'm highlighting here, no glands underneath the skin, no hair, possible danger with speculum looking in. Skin here covers the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, which is soft and porous, pneumatic. Cerumen, earwax. From secretions of sebaceous and apocrine glands of the outer half of EAM. Every time you see the word EAM, just think external auditory meatus or ear canal. The skin in your ear canal is very thin. It moves very slowly like a glacier. And then on to the bony portion. May take several months to reach the border of the cartilaginous ear canal. The skin meets the hairs and cerumen, which stops its movement, forms wrinkles, dried dead skin on the surface, dried skin glacier breaks and turns into flakes, mixes with wax. Ooh, isn't that sweet? That's what we see as earwax. Well, it's all, you know, what to say is that the ear canal skin migrates from the drum and it migrates slowly outwards over months. Otoscopic examination of the ear canal, pull ear up and back to straighten the ear canal. Children tend to have a different kind of ear canal. It goes down instead of up. So in children, you pull a kid's ear down and not up and back. But we are going to be HISs and we are not looking that much at the children's ears. You may have heard of TMJ, temporal mandibular joint syndrome. I wonder if I have a picture of that. Not sure if I do in this particular PowerPoint presentation, but I might. Then again, I kind of doubt it. I ain't sure. Nah, don't worry about it. TMJ is basically your jaw. Now I'm going to your jawbone. When we think about your jawbone, it goes up 
and the up portion of your jaw bone, when you move your jaw, you can feel it beside your ear, okay? And the top of your jaw bone ends in these two bumps, and they rock. They rock right underneath the floor of your ear canal. Sometimes the jawbone joint gets arthritis. And when it gets arthritis, it hurts. And it hurts as an ear pain. TMJ, temporal side bone, mandible, mandibular, jaw, mandible, joint syndrome. TMJ, temporal mandibular joint syndrome. I think I know where you'll find this slide. I'll bet you dollars to donuts I know where to find this puppy. And if I see it here, I will show it to you. I'm going to shrink that. I'll shrink this. We'll go into overview of the whole ear of last week's, and I'll bet you I've got it in there. I'm not sure, but let me just see if I've got a nice picture of it, just for the heck of it. Oh, by the way, yeah, here I do. Ha, <laughs> lucked out. Okay, here's your temporal bone, the side bone, okay? Here's the temporal bone, pulling it away, and it has a petrous portion, which is the inner part, the mastoid portion, which is the pneumatic porous part. There's the bottom of your mastoid bone. That right there is that bone behind your ear. And here's TMJ. Here's your jaw, the mandible, and it has that point and this point. And that's the joint that gets sometimes arthritis, and it hurts underneath your ear canal. And sometimes a person is going to be seeing you because the pain is in his ear when actually he should be seeing a dentist. Okay, and that's why I'm telling you about it, TMJ syndrome. If someone complains about pain in the outer ear canal and you've looked in and you don't see any infection whatsoever, you might want to suspect TMJ syndrome. And then the person should be seeing a dentist, not really you. But anyway, it's good to have a healthy idea of what these things are. Now, when you're looking in an outer ear, I'll just show you some more pieces here. This is called atresia. This person has no ear canal. Okay? This person likely has a syndrome called Treacher Collins. Treacher is like the word teacher, but with an R in it. Treacher Collins. C O L L I N S. The eyes are kind of close together, the ears are not formed. Mind you, the cochlea is formed. Okay, the person has an, a normal inner ear, a normal eighth nerve, a normal brain stem, and a normal brain. The person just does not have an outer ear canal. Often they go for surgery so the surgeon can create an outer ear canal, but this is called atresia. A T R E S I A. Atresia. Atresia means no ear canal, completely closed ear canal, atresia. When you're looking at the peripheral auditory pathway, let's look at it. Peripheral means outer, you know, the, 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 the ear, the whole ear parts. From external to the inner, sound waves caught by the pinna, external auditory meatus, tympanic membrane, middle ear ossicles, the bones, hitting the oval window, the entrance to the cochlea, oval window, and then you've got fluid waves in what they call the membranous labyrinth. That means fluid waves inside the cochlea, and then you've got vibration of what they call the basilar membrane. That's in the cochlea as well. You've got fluid movement, and then you've got this ripple taking place, and that ripple taking place excites the inner hair cells of the ear. And so it says bending of hair cells of organ of corti. And organ of corti just means deep inside your cochlea. We'll cover that manana, not to worry. Okay, this is just giving you kind of the overview there. Now here is a hairy old ear. Okay, check this out, a hairy tragus. Condition found more often in men than women. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, here's another source, a picture of atresia. Mild developmental abnormality of the pinna. 
complete failure of canalization of the external auditory meatus. Surgical reconstruction may be successful in the presence of a relatively normal middle ear. Here's a normal eardrum. You're actually a photographic shot of, the, of a normal right ear. Let's look at the pieces and parts. This is called the annulus, the outer rim, A-N-N-U-L-U-S, annulus, annulus, okay? Annulus, the outer rim of your ear canal. And then you can see the pars tensa. Here's the pars tensa. And then you can see the manubrium of the malleus, the handle of the malleus bone. And that's on the inner half of the eardrum. And here's the umbo. And here's the cone of light. And you can see it at five o'clock. So you know it's a right ear. And when you look closely here, that's actually the next bone of the middle ear, the incus. So the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. You can actually sort of see through like a bathroom window, you know? Here's another picture, a different kind of a shot, showing you once again the annulus, the pars tensa, the manubrium of the malleus, the umbo, the cone of light, I can't really see the pars flacida very well on here, but anyway, the pieces and parts. Another close-up of an eardrum. How big is your eardrum? When you look into an ear, your eardrum is about this big, as big as the end of your finger, about a centimeter across. It's not very big, okay? I can just see my wife coming home. She just got over here. She's just walking up the front door here. But anyway, just, it's just about a centimeter in size. That's, by the way, is how big your cochlea is. Your cochlea and your eardrum are the same size. All right, share screen here again. Taking a look-see. Okay, a normal eardrum. And here is the hairy area of the outer half of your external auditory meatus. The skin here covers cartilage. This is where wax is formed. This is where hair grows. If you're looking deeper inside the ear canal, now you're looking at the skin. It's as smooth as a baby's behind. You can see the eardrum closer now, and there's no wax, and there's no hair there. The skin here covers bone. So this is the inner portion of the external auditory meatus. This is the outer portion of the external auditory meatus. This is the picture that I was talking about. The skin migrates out and sort of gets wrinkly and flaky as it gets toward the outer end here and begins to flake off and gets all kind of, uh, as it mixes with wax, yikes. Well, here's a close-up of nice, fresh wax. Nothing wrong with it. Yellow, it's on the ends of the hairs of the ear canal. It keeps the ear lubricated. There is nothing wrong with wax in the ear. As long as when you look in an ear, you can still see the drum. If there's a bit of wax around the outside, who cares? It's okay. Ah, but that's getting a bit gross. Okay? Now you can see how the wax is filling the ear canal. And you can only through this black slit here, very carefully, you've really got to, behind that would be the eardrum. This person will have no hearing loss because sound is able to get through here, so they will have no hearing loss at all. However, you need to do what's called cerumen management. You'll have to make sure that either you or a nurse or a physician takes that earwax out because you cannot take an ear mold impression for a hearing aid until that's out. But this wax is relatively new. It's yellow, it's moist, it's soft, it glistens, all mixed with the hair. Let's, yeah, isn't that special? Now look at this. Three different types of earwax. Whoops, newer earwax, older and older. You can see it's now mixed with dirt and debris, dust and everything, and skin particles. So ugh, lots of this will be harder. This will be softer. Here is another pathology of the ear. And so is this, by the way. This is called stenosis. 
S-T-E-N, stenosis, O-S-I-S, stenosis, S-T-E-N-O-S-I-S. That is what we call a partial closing of the ear canal, a partial closing. Atresia is a complete closure. Stenosis is a partial closure. And stenosis can be formed by anything. This here is a natural one. This is wax partially closing off the ear canal. But here, this is a kid who stuck a bean in his ear. So now he's got stenosis too, because he stuck something in his ear, a plastic bead found in this young child. Okay, they had to remove this thing and get it out of the ear canal. The kid was freaking out. So a general anesthetic was required for removal due to the lack of patient cooperation. Yikes, all right? This is also stenosis. You're partially plug plugging the ear canal, but this time by putting something in your ears. There's stenosis. You got a bug in your ear. This is real. This is not lying. Bugs like to go in the ear. It's 98.6 degrees. That's why nurses take blood temperature in the ear, okay? Or with a thermometer under the tongue, but the ear works as well. Other symptoms include conductive hearing loss if the foreign body occludes the meatus. Pain and bleeding if there's been local trauma, and in this case, an acute otitis. Now, let's break the words out. Oto, ear. Itis, inflammation. External, outer ear canal infection. Produced by local irritation of the meatal skin. The underlying cause for the problem only became apparent after treatment of the secondary otitis. Yeah, yeah, look at this, though. It's a bug in the ear. Good grief. Okay, happens. Looking in the ear canal and you see two little eyes looking back at you. Yeah. All right. You could stick uh, an ear at people who use Q-tips. Oh, I was trying to get the ear wax out. Yeah, right. You pushed now the ear, the, the tip of the, uh, the uh, Q-tip against the skin of your ear canal and you've caused abrasions. It's very easy to do. Now you're in the bony portion of the ear canal. Look at how smooth the skin is. Here's the eardrum. And that skin, there's no give, okay? It's just it's a, the skin is just like, the, like your shin skin in the front of your leg. There's no give. So you bruise it very easily, in this case, by the use of a cotton-tipped applicator, also known as Q-tip. Hematoma, that just means a blood blister. Aggressive use of cotton-tipped Q-tip, evidence of more severe trauma can be found. In this case, a large blood blister has been the result. This can precipitate outer ear infection or otitis externa. This is another case of outer ear infection or inflammation. The skin is all swollen and you're creating a stenosis because you've got an infection of the skin in your outer ear canal. Here's a good word to know, severe otalgia. Otalgia, oto is ear, algia is pain. Otalgia, ear pain. So what does TMJ give you? Temporal mandibular joint, otalgia, ear pain. What's otitis, ear infection, otoitis. What's otitis media, middle ear infection. Otitis externa, outer ear infection. You break down the Latin, and there it is. Ooh, look at this. Another case of compromise of the external canal. Bony exotoses. These are non-cancerous. They're benign bony growths in the bony portion of the ear canal. Usually from the cold, especially from swimming. Found more in women than men. Women float better. Women make best long distance swimmers. Women are the ones who swim across the Great Lakes, like in Ontario, Canada, they'll swim from New York State to the province of Ontario, like 30 miles across the lake. And the Great Lakes are kind of cold and long distance cold water swimmers often get bony exotoses. This is a natural formation that the bone, the ears trying to protect the eardrum from the cold. That's why you're what's doing that. Doctors can easily remove these. They'll go in there with a black and decker drill and just drill them out. <laughs> Whoa, here's an osteoma. Oma means tumor. 
okay? In contrast to exotoses, which are common, osteomas are rare benign tumors of the temporal bone, usually lying in the external ear canal. If they occur, they are more likely to warrant surgical removal as they more frequently compromise the canal. These don't really, because I can still see the eardrum plainly. And you can tell which ear this is just by looking at it. It's got to be the left, because the cone of light is at 7 o'clock, not at 5 o'clock. Here's a perforation of the eardrum. Okay, mucoid, mucus, otitis media. Okay, most cases can resolve of themselves, but if the hole gets too large, it needs, uh, what do you call it, uh, surgical replacement. What they do sometimes is they lay cigarette paper, get this, I'm not lying, over top of the hole. And that will form like a scrim for the skin to grow across and heal. Here's more of a traumatic perforation of the eardrum, okay? More of a real woo, all right? This person will likely got this from a blow to the side of the head. This person's going to require tympanoplasty. They're going to have to get a skin graft from somewhere and put that on to make that heal. Here's acute otitis media, middle ear infection, and it's woo. It's bulging the eardrum. Now the eardrum is bulged. That hurts. That's called an earache. We'll be covering more of that next week and the week after. Here's acute otitis media again. Middle ear infection. You've got all pus in the middle ear space and it's bulging the whole eardrum. Okay, the beginning of otitis media. And I'll show you more of these pictures next week. Okay, the fluid in the middle ear space. This is the early fluid in the middle ear space, early infection. You'll notice it's clear. Here it's yellow because it's now it's pus. First it's clear, then it turns full of pus. Pretty bizarre. So when you've got early otitis media, okay, that means that the, the fluid behind the middle ear is clear. But that's more a subject for next week. We'll be covering much more of that stuff. You'll be looking, but here's bubbles behind the ear. In the behind the eardrum. Here's a tube that's often put in kids' ears, okay, to alleviate otitis media, but we'll go there later. Let's look at our notes and make sure we'll finish, we have finished today. So here we go. Got only about five, ten minutes left. So when you're looking at your notes here, you'll see all of this stuff, and you've seen this before. Look at this. Three layers. There's your ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Don't worry about the area of the tympanic membrane. Basically, it's as big as the end of your little finger. The umbo, the manubrium of the malleus, the annulus, nodes of Ranvier, that's the Y shape that separates pars tensa from pars flaccida. There's pars tensa. Moving on down the page to page two, pars flaccida, cone of light, orientation of right and left tympanic membranes, Five o'clock cone of light in the right ear. Seven o'clock cone of light in the left ear. Yeah, I can see your puppy turning around behind you, just nicely laying down. Neat. It's cool. So outer ear embryology, don't worry about this stuff. I just gave this to you earlier, told you what those three original layers of tissue form into. We talked about that earlier. The tympanic membrane is unique in that it has all three layers of that tissue. So much of the stuff I talked about, and then here, you know, I'm just showing it to you in writing. Here's the physiology of the outer ear. This is where we talked about the resonance of the outer ear, what it does, that added stuff to the high frequencies. So it's mainly a funnel to gather sound. And we said the resonance of your concha is between five and 6,000 hertz. The resonance of your ear canal, or EAM, as a quarter wave resonator. We'll talk a little bit about this next week, and this is how we're going to begin our session next week. We'll finish the outer ear, and then we'll go into the middle ear, okay? Because I know I won't get all of this done today. I've only got about another five minutes, so why bother? But I want you to look at this carefully. The ear canal 
is sort of like a coffee cup. Look at this cup. See how it's round on the sides and it has a bottom to it, but the top is open and I don't want to tip it or I'll lose my coffee, okay? It's cold anyway, but anyway, it's a cylinder. All cylinders that are closed at one end and open at the other end, like a cup, those are called quarter wave resonators. And in English, this means that they resonate with sound waves four times their length. Four times their length. So read with me. Recall from acoustics, external auditory meatus is a quarter wave resonator. It's a closed tube at one end, and it resonates when it's one quarter the length of the sound wave. Hmm. So how long is the EAM? We said two and a half centimeters. All right. Let's say it's two and a half centimeters. What's it going to resonate best with? Sound waves that are four times as long. So what's four times two and a half? Ten. Okay, it's going to resonate best with sound waves that are ten centimeters long. Hmm, okay. But now, remember in acoustics this morning, we said wavelength is speed of sound over frequency. Frequency is speed of sound over wavelength. All right, we know what the speed of sound is, 340 meters per second. And what's the wavelength? 10 centimeters. Okay, because in this case, we want to find out what's the frequency that the ear is going to resonate with. Well, it's two and a half centimeters long, and it's going to resonate with sound waves four times the length. Four times two and a half is 10. What's 10 centimeters? Point one meter. We've got to compare meters to meters. So you're doing 340 divided by 0.1. And what do you get when you do that? Hmm, 3,400. 340 divided by 0.1. Let me see if I can try that on my calculator, see if it works. 340 divided by 0.1 equals, yep, 3,400. That's going to be the resonance of your ear canal. But your ear canal is made of flesh and bone. It's not made out of glass. Okay, so that 3,400 gets fudged a bit. And that fudged a bit translates into this here. Here, I'll go way over here, way up here, way up here, go up, higher, higher, translates into that. The 3,400 gets spread from about 1,500 hertz out to about 4,000 hertz. It gets spread because the ear canal is made of flesh and bone. But the reason why you have this resonance is because the ear canal is a quarter wave resonator. It's a cylinder closed at one end like a coffee cup. All those types of objects vibrate best with sound waves that are four times their length. Well, 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 three holes in the ground. Okay, big events. All right. The last thing I'll talk about, and I'll just mention to you so that you can say you've heard of it, but we will be talking more about this later on. Occlusion effect. Now think about this occlusion effect. Your own voice sounds louder when you plug an ear. So plug one ear. Go ahead. Plug one ear and start talking. Say, hey, Ted, how are you doing up in Canada? Hey, Ted, how are you doing up in Canada? <laughs> so where do you hear your voice loudest? In the ear you plugged. Yeah. Okay, that's the occlusion effect. All right? Your own voice sounds louder when your outer ear is plugged. Scratch out middle. Get that, that middle out of there. That's a pile of BS. It is not. Okay? It's when your outer ear is plugged. This is normal. It should happen. If it doesn't happen, you've got a middle ear pathology. Okay? Interesting. Weird, weird, weird. You ever hear a tape-recorded voice? You ever hear your voice recorded? And you think, oh, yeah, 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 that sounds awful. And you're hearing a recording of your voice, and everybody else says, oh, that sounds just like you. And you're the only one that hates the recording of your voice. You know why that is? That's because for the first time, you are hearing yourself as others hear you.
You're hearing yourself only through air conduction, sound waves coming from the recording to your ears. But when you talk, when you hear yourself talk, normally you hear yourself through the air, but you also hear yourself through the bone, through bone conduction. That's why you sound more rich and normal to yourself. When you listen to your voice on a recording, you sound kind of tinny. You don't sound quite the same. And that's because you're hearing yourself only through air conduction. So when you think about the occlusion effect, okay, what is that from? Well, that's because you're talking and the, 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 your loudness of your voice is resonating the mass of your skull because low frequencies resonate density, mass. And then that mass of your skull is rattling the cartilaginous portion of your ear canal. And then you're plugging your ear and you're preventing that added resonance from escaping. You're preventing it. So ordinarily, it just goes out. You know, your bone, your loudness of your voice rattles the mass of your skull, wiggling the cartilaginous portion. And yes, you hear yourself louder, but you really hear yourself louder when you plug your own ear and you're directing it all back in. But at any rate, we'll talk more about this manana next week. Right now, we're just reading the bottom here. Tape recorded voice. Why does a recording of your voice sound weird only to you? Because others hear you by air conduction. You hear your own voice by air and bone. You therefore hear your own voice louder and lower, richer. The low frequencies, here, here's what I said. Here's exactly what I had said a couple of seconds ago. The lows of your voice resonate the mass of your skull. This in turn vibrates the cartilaginous portion of your ear canal. Plugging your ear prevents this from escaping. So, next week, we'll begin with this section. Next week, when we reconvene, I'm going to go over this again, and then we will launch into the middle ear. Looky, looky, though, the very bottom here, here's your disorders of the outer ear. Osis, atresia, osteoma, and here is something to put a star by. Problems of your outer or middle ears cause conductive hearing loss. This is where I will stop. Conductive. There's two types of hearing loss. One's called conductive. The other one's called sensory neural. A conductive hearing loss is a physical blockage of sound. So earwax in the outer ear causes conductive hearing loss. Middle ear infection causes conductive hearing loss. Anything that blocks the passage of sound is conductive hearing loss. And guess what? Conductive hearing loss is usually fixable. Conductive hearing loss can be fixed by medicine. Don't need hearing aids. Sensory neural hearing loss, you can't fix. It's permanent and it's damage to the inner ear or cochlea. 95% of hearing loss is sensory neural, inner ear created. Only 5% of hearing loss is caused by external or middle ear pathology. All right. So there we have it. Next week, we'll pick up right where we left off here. Thanks for joining. I'm glad at least one person showed up. The others, well, sucks to be you. You got to watch it later. So anyway, thanks a lot. We'll, we'll sign off here, okay? Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah.